Welcome to the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. Tonight's program, Piyut, Hebrew Poetry and World Music, centers around a very special project, the residency of Yair Harel, a talented performer, artistic director from Jerusalem. Uh, Yair is the Schusterman visiting Israeli artist at the Magnus this fall, and he's teaching at UC Berkeley. We're teaching in this room a course called Jewish Nightlife. And he's performing across the Bay Area. His repertoire is taking the Bay Area in a storm of music and poetry. And he's uh, really increasing our collective awareness of Middle Eastern Jewish and Israeli cultures. Um, he's joined tonight by the ensemble Tafilalt from Jerusalem and also his wife uh, Merav Ben David will be joining the ensemble. And the performance tonight is also augmented by words by our very own Professor Robert Alter, who's sitting here in the front row. You will hear from him shortly. I just uh, also want to remind everybody that tonight's program is co-presented with the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies and the Center for Jewish Studies. And it was also made possible with support from the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, the Consul General of Israel in the Pacific Northwest, Piyut North America, and above all, the Israel Institute. It's uh, a pleasure to have everybody here, and I ask you to please welcome Yair Harel and Ensemble Tefilat to the stage. Enjoy. Yeah. 
משקיעים ונשקיעים, אני משקיעים ומקבל שכר, ומשקיעים ובינם מקבלים שכר. אני עמל ובמילים אני עמל. someone whose uh, academic interest and interest as a reader is not uh, really piyut, but Hebrew poetry. And it, 
as some of you know, beyond that Hebrew fiction. Now, for nearly a thousand years, perhaps a little bit less than that, uh, Piyut was the only kind of poetry that was written in Hebrew, and some of it was written in um, Aramaic as well, but uh, the preponderance in Hebrew. And I, I'd like to just share a couple of ideas about how that fits into the larger picture of Hebrew poetry. Now, in the biblical period, um, poetry was written uh, in all kinds of genres for all kinds of purposes, and not all of them were strictly religious. That is, uh, th there, uh, there's didactic poetry, or the sort we find in, in the book of Proverbs. Poetry was used as an instrument for uh, exploring uh, um, philosophic issues, theological issues, as in Job, and particularly the poetry and prose poetry of Kohelet, Ecclesiastes is, is uh, vigorously philosophic. Uh, then there was love poetry. Uh, of course, all we have really is the Song of Songs, which is very late, but there are indications that there was in circulation a genre of love poetry earlier in the biblical period. Uh, then here and there, there are teasing little fragments where you, you get little snippets of popular poetry. Uh, Isaiah actually has a couple of lines of a poem about a prostitute who has lost her charms, which he turns in, into some prophetic purpose. Um, so there was a lot of activity. And then, of course, there was war poetry, uh, victory poetry. Now, the one category of biblical poetry that, that anticipates piyut is uh, psalms, but by no means all of psalms. That is, you could say that some of the psalms are liturgical poems, that is, they played a role in the temple service, but the temple service had no text, that, that is, it had actions, sacrifice of animals, libations, uh, meal offerings, and, and uh, these were accompanied by psalms. Other psalms are ret introspective, wisdom psalms, uh, personal psalms, historical psalms that have nothing to do with, with the temple service. Well, um, by the early Christian centuries, um, all this was shut down. And, and what we have is piyut, a name that comes from the Greek, its cognate was poet, uh, because Greek w was the, the major language being spoken in, in, in and around the land of Israel at the end of the biblical period and in the early Christian centuries. Um, and now you had a text, the, the, uh, the earliest text of the Sidur. And Piyut was very much composed as an ornament to the text. So there is something quite ornamental about a lot of the piyut. Um, not all. Some of the piyutim are very direct and touching. When I visited Yair and Francesco's class early this week, Yair led the, the students in singing an Aramaic piyut, which we include uh, in um, uh, Yamim no Ra'im, uh, with, with uh, the uh, very poignant words merciful one who answers to the poor, answer us. Merciful one who answers to the brokenhearted, answer us. So th there is that kind of directness. But I think more typically, there's ornamentation. And the ornamentation uh, goes in a number of different directions. Uh, my friend Benjamin Hashab, who I think is the greatest living authority, not only on Hebrew verse forms, but also on prosody in general, a poetic form, says that rhyme as a regular organizing principle in poetry was invented in Piyut in, in the early Christian centuries. Uh, they composed poems in acrostics, alphabetic acrostics, double acrostics, backward alphabetic acrostics, acrostics of the, the, poetic, uh, the poet's name, and some of the Hebrew got to be very strange, and I would say Byzantine. 
That is, you find uh, th those who, have tr who know some Hebrew and try to make out the piyut for the avodah service in, in Yom Kippur will get a sense of it. And a lot of it is not very comprehensible. So you find lines in, in the piyut like patz ro'eh ne'eman. Now, ro'eh ne'eman means faithful shepherd, but uh, you might not immediately know to whom that refers. In fact, it refers to, to Moses. You don't want to simply say Moses, because anybody can do that. You need some kind of ingenious epithet. So you call him the faithful shepherd. Then what is this? Patz. Patz is an invented form from the Hebrew verb patza, which means to open the mouth. And so it becomes, even though it never existed in Hebrew and goes against all Hebrew grammar, it becomes a term for um, speaking, for uttering, because there's a sense that the language of the piyut needs to be differentiated from uh, uh, normal language. Now, a big change occurred, and I'm going to really conclude with, with this. At the end of the 10th century in Al-Andalus, in the, the southern Muslim part of Spain, when uh, a young man named Dunish Ben Labat, who had uh, grown up in North Africa, then went to Baghdad, and from Baghdad he came to Cordoba, uh, came up with, with, with this revolutionary idea, which was shocking to many, which is to write Hebrew poetry following Arabic models, which meant a couple of things. First, it meant following the Arabic verse forms, <coughs> using quantitative meter and, and uh, rhymes running through the whole poem, but also composing um, uh, secular poems, love poems, drinking poems, philosophic poems, and so forth. But Dunash, like those who followed him in the next two centuries, also composed uh, Piyutim. But th there's a, a Zmira, a song sung at, at the Sabbath table, uh, which is uh, uh, an alphabetic acrostic of his name, which both Ashkenazim and Sfaradim sing with very different melodies, Duroye uh, Kla Leven in Bat. So um, th there was a, a, a new infusion of life in Piyut with a Hebrew, which was now recorrected to be more or less uh, in, in line with biblical uh, usage. But more things happen. For example, uh, there's a category of piyut which is called ahava, love, which is a piyut inserted before you say the blessing, uh, who, uh, blessed are you, O Lord, who loves Israel. And in the, um, uh, the piyutim under the category of love, ahava, uh, the poets picked up uh, Arabic models of love poetry, and they reworked them for, um, uh, uh, for religious purposes. So this became extraordinarily enriching. So from, from that point on, I would say, from the end of the 10th century CE until the present, because the movement went on from uh, Spain to Italy to Holland, and then we have the birth of modern Hebrew uh, literature in 18th century Germany. Um, the, during this thousand year hiatus, when nobody wrote secular poetry in Hebrew, uh, poetry continued to be composed by the Paitanim, by the authors uh, of Piyut. And from one point of view, it's as though they kept the coal of poetry glowing. And I'm not entirely sure. If you imagine a historical counterfactual uh, scenario in which no poetry would ever have been written in Hebrew from the end of the Bible until the Spanish period, would they have been able to uh, create this extraordinary renaissance? Uh, I'm not sure that they would. So th this extraordinarily fruitful dialogue between piyut and other kinds of Hebrew poetry is one of many things for which we can owe, owe a debt of gratitude to piyut. Thank you. So 
I said uh, previously, um, we're also teaching. And then we try to really be representative as much as we can to the tradition that I've been trying to learn for many years. And as much as I can to have it pass through me. But our work here is a bit different, even though it's very, very connected to the same concept of trying to be a channel of something, of a secret that is coming from many generations. But our way to do it is just to bring it into our very sincere and wor world contemporary Israeli soundscape, which has so many different things going on inside. And each one of us grew up in different places, different influences. And the way we, are, we found this, we call this ensemble tafilat, like a variation on, on tefillah, on prayer, a very personal variation. We're not, not uh, taking on myself. That was a reminder for me, needs a reminder. To, yeah. um, to now say, represent this whole world of Jewish music. I'm not Iraqi, I'm not Moroccan, I'm not Yemenite, I'm not Ashkenazi, I'm not any of these things, and I'm all of them. And we're trying in a way to navigate and to find a way that is we can really, from all of, all of this heritage and um, contemporary life brings something that is sincere for us. And we're continuing with it actually an Israeli poem, Tfilah from Abraham Khalfi, that Yonatan here composed. <laughs> כל המילים עבדו בקולי והיו כאילמות אפלה. אך עדיין רואות עיניי זוהר עיניו של ילד ועוד רואות עיניי כוכב אין דומה לו בזוהר שמחתם הנושמת כאביו שנדמה כי לא יחלוף עד עולם קרוע אחרע לפני דמות אלוהים עפי מעיניי נעלם אל נא תרע לתמימים הם אינם יודעים מדוע
So it's good that you came. Oh, oh, oh. 
heard the most ancient Jewish tune that we know of. It was found in manuscripts in the Cairo of Giza. Not only in words, but also in notation, medieval notation, that could be interpreted, even though there are arguments about it. But more or less, this is the ancient, most ancient document we have of Jewish music. Maybe traveling from Italy, from France, but it was found in Egypt. So it closes the circle. Or opens it again.
someone coming from East Europe trying to be a farmer and he has this fantasy about being a, you know, a Bedouin, some kind of Israeli Jewish Bedouin, connected to the ground, connected to the land, connected to the... And, um, but still, you know, there's this very big echo coming from East Europe, coming from diaspora, from long, this continuous Jewish longing that's expressed as we as we feel it in this in this uh, song in this tfila called Shedimati. Thank you. 
famous, it's called Yedid Nefesh, and you see by the movement of your heads that many of you have come to meet this beaut. But the one I didn't know growing up in Israel, it's just like this small story assembles something, it symbolizes something that has been become more or less what I've been doing in the last 15 years. So I grew up in, in Israel having you know, such, so many different layers of knowledge, of wisdom, of traditional spirit and thought and heritage around me, but you know, growing up meeting just, just a very, very, very narrow you know, element of that. Even though I grew up in a religious environment, in an orthodox environment, still meeting, I met so, you know, I met, if we take a deed nefesh as a symbol, I knew one tune from the, uh, probably the one you know, and another one from a contem more contemporary Israeli, like a sweet one, that probably, if, it's this, if there's a second one you know, it's also probably also that one. <laughs> now, in the, in, during our journey, also really underneath my nose, in Jerusalem, for example, where I lived, just, I came to understand that there are mainly, like maybe 40, 50 different tunes to this song, each one of them really opening up a world of emotional, spiritual heritage and expression and knowledge and history and, and communities, you know, the, just through one song, the world can, you know, the Jewish world opens up. And it's not about, you know, another nice melody. It's about each one of them is like a memory, a living memory of a whole world of, you can say, human, Jewish spirit, thought, longing, expression, emotion, etc. So if you, could, if you want to see that, if you want to really, uh, See that I'm not just uh, telling you the story. You can go to the Butte website and you can listen to it. That's what we've been trying to do also. To just have that knowledge outside so people can be aware of that. And this is really a, a shocking, just you know, this little story is quite shocking. If you take it to questions of contemporary Israeli and Jewish identity, as I said in the beginning, I'm not Ashkenazi, I'm not Sephardic, I'm not Iraqi, I'm not Yemenite, I'm not Moroccan, but maybe I'm all of those in a way. What does that mean? So we'll take you for a short tour through uh, several tunes that we met on the way. And
traveling to Baghdad, traveling to Bombay, a twist through Breslav, and back to North America. <laughs> Something like that. Ashkenaz, Israel. So in this last piece, you've been a very, really good, you, you proved that you know how to listen, and I'm sure that you also know how to sing. We have a very simple role coming up for you in this last piece, <coughs> which is a, a prayer we want to recite together. It's been recited for 2,000 years and still relevant, meaning it still haven't totally been answered. Maybe it should we had some moments, but uh, and this is a prayer that is asking for good leaders, for justice <laughs> leaders, for justice, for justifying, you know, leaders that know how to do peace and justice and compassion in the world. I think it's probably the most, you know, that can make a difference. So our first project together many years ago was uh, not, not, nothing less but trying to compose Tfilat Shemona Yisre, the Amida, you know, very simple challenge. Especially because it's said usually, but you know, silently. So, <laughs> so each one took it. We were about almost 18 people, students of our, most of them, most of our students of our, one of our really great teachers, Andre Haidu, in Israel, and a great you know, composer and educator and musician. So each one took a um, different prayer, and this is one of them. Hashiva Shoftenu Kevarishona, the Yoatzenu Kedatechila, Asir Mimenu Yagun Ramacha. You don't have to know maybe by heart. You even don't, don't have don't have to know Hebrew. Your role will be Ha Shiva Na, sung like this. Ha Shiva Na. Wow! We should have asked you to. <laughs> Standing? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so, well, you can. But you don't have to. But if you want to, you can. But this, if you're up to one more song, it will be a dance song. Okay? A Chabad dance song. So you can stay up, stay down, stand up, sit down. Don't cheat him, okay? Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here.